battling basic <laughs> all right we are officially on the air for battling basic episode number four and on today's episode we got mcmaster head strength and conditioning coach ben bahrami ben thanks so much for being on how's it going man no problem thanks for having me it's good it's a friday it's sunny <laughs> <laughs> taking care of your dog coming uh come to mcmaster do a podcast train some people later exactly yeah it's a good friday so far <laughs> all right so um ben i've been working with ben for the past little while and i've been pretty happy with the programming i've been getting um as an undergraduate in kinesiology at mcmaster i took ben's athletic training and conditioning class learned a lot of stuff in that class um set my foundation for my knowledge and strength and conditioning and since i've been doing some research expanding on the class, not, not heavily expanding on it because, you know, we learned so much in that class. <laughs> it was he content heavy, right, Ben? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I actually have a lot of questions for Ben on today's podcast, so hopefully today's podcast will be pretty engaging. So um, I'm just going to get right into it because I have a lot to ask you. So the first thing I want to ask you about is, is posture, right? Um, posture is something that's very heavily emphasized in the strength and conditioning community. And um, I just was wondering if you can explain why it's so important because it raises a lot of questions. For instance, like if you see a guy like LeBron playing basketball, the guy can dribble, the guy can shoot, the guy can drive through a lot of people and score. If his posture wasn't good, would that affect his game? Like something tells me no, but at the same time, I feel like there's an alternate explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, the posture is always going to be relative, right? Like uh, it just depends on, first and foremost, you have to find some range that you fit between. That doesn't necessarily mean exact degrees or exact ranges of motion that everyone has to accomplish, but at the end of the day, everyone's human. And if you don't fit within a range of movement, then uh, you're going to find imbalances and you're going to find some other way to accomplish movements that are in everyday life or in the sport um, so when you talk about someone like LeBron or even like a sport like yourself such as wrestling the other thing about playing sports is the sports change our posture to what's actually better for that sport so there's a fine line between trying to be healthy as possible and fitting in the range that you should fit in within the human range, but also the stiffness that some sports create to prevent further injuries or to promote further performance. So um, with, in terms of posture, there's the regular uh, range that we have, to, we have to fit in. But for example, a basketball player would have a lot stiffer lateral chain through his lower, lower legs because they cut a lot because they jump a lot. So if that basketball athlete wasn't stiffer in the peroneal area, then they would probably suffer a lot more ankle twists than they would uh, playing. Like for example, if you put a swimmer on a basketball court, chances are that swimmer is gonna twist an ankle more than a basketball player would yeah. because of that stiffness that's created over time. Because the swimmer is not stiff. Because the swimmer is used to being in water and not used to having the lateral chain um, have so much stimulus every day. Okay. Yeah. So like these deficiencies that are generated through playing your sport, pretty much you need them then, no? Yeah. So that's why it's a fine line. I mean, I wouldn't say it's deficiency. I think it's a uh, change in posture to kind of, um, to be able to perform a movement. And I think a lot of people misunderstand that, you know, I play a sport, I must be healthy. Well, I mean, the human body wasn't really designed to play basketball or wasn't really designed to wrestle <laughs> or do anything. So these sports kind of push our limits, and that's why our body adapts. And that's essentially what our body does is it adapts to the situations that you put it in. So if you're sitting down in a, in a cubicle for eight hours a day, that's what your body will adapt to. So mm -hmm. then if you sit down in a cubicle, your body would be like, okay, I'm going to adapt to a sitting posture. Okay, because okay, that's that's what we do. We adapt and we get better. And yeah, that's you what you caught me is. the other day. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I was just sitting on campus doing some work and I was hunched over and Ben walks by. He's like, Ahmed, no, no. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you work on the posture, then what is that doing? Is that trying to minimize the deficiency to an ex like having that or er, that adaptation to an extreme level, or is it just? Uh, 
trying to bring you back to normal so that you don't experience any injuries? Well, I mean, like, so, for example, if we get an athlete, first of all, what we ask the athletes, you know, like, obviously the sport they play, the position they play, past injuries, uh, and then just sports that they've played throughout their life, right? So you, if, if someone has jumped a lot in their adolescence, then their Achilles and their ankle and the whole lower leg will be stiffer, and that's what helps their ability to jump. Mm -hmm. So there's some stiffness, some stability that's, um, that's beneficial to our sports, but then it can go further than that point right so if i'm a basketball player and my ankles are generally stiffer that's good because you don't want the, their ankles to be as loose as the swimmers or loose as, <laughs> as, yeah. as someone that doesn't need that lateral cutting but then it becomes to a point where you know if they get a couple of ankle twists anyways by stepping on someone and it becomes even stiffer and even less move, uh, oh. movement then you start to um start to try to correct something because then it be mm. then it wreaks havoc on either the joint or above or joint below. So the way our human body is kind of laid out is your your ankle should be mo like, should be mobile. Um, your knees really shouldn't be mobile anywhere from side to side. It's really in the sagittal plane because it's a hinge joint. So it just flexes and extends. Front and back, yeah. Yeah, your hip needs to be mobile. Uh, and, if, uh, and then lo your lower back needs to be stable. Your T-spine needs to be mobile. Um, your scaps needs to be stable. And then your shoulders need to be mobile, and that's that's really uh, what I'm outlining. There is a concept called joint by joint approach, and it's popularized by Greg Cook. Actually, it's made by Greg Cook, and um, it's I mean that thought process has been around for a while. He just kind of laid it out in a very simple, simplistic way like that. But essentially, let's say if the hip is supposed to be mobile, and someone is sitting down for a prolonged period of time, um, or their sport is bent over in nature like your sport in yeah. wrestling um then you start to develop these uh postural i would say imbalances but if they're past a certain point then imbalances and then you know if your hip becomes um, immobile then what has to be um mobile for that and it's the low back or the knee right so if the hip can't move side to side then the joint above or below has to move side to side and they're not designed to do that so yeah in terms of posture it's really complex because you don't want to look at a certain joint you want to look at how the whole body moves together in global movements and if there's an issue there then you start doing further assessments but if someone looks like they have po bad posture but their global movements are awesome their squat their bad their their uh push up their lunge their step up and if all that looks awesome then there's no problem then if they have no pain there's no problem so hmm. Posture can be a very tricky thing because <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. three three hundred and sixty degrees and the dimensional. There's there's different joints involved, and then it's all about just. It's not really about ranges of motion within a joint. It's about ranges of motion within movement. Okay. If that makes sense. Uh, like yeah, how you actually engage in the movement. Exactly. Um, okay, so pretty much what you're saying is that when you experience uh, adaptations to your sport, it can go to a super extreme level at some point and when you work on your posture you're just trying to prevent it from going to that level and you want to keep it pretty much at an optimal level like yeah. you want some adaptation but not too much exactly yeah exactly so i mean i know a basketball player is probably not going to be squatting as deep as um let's say a hmm, it's a well-rounded sport that doesn't have a lot of stability, the mobility issues. So let's say um, a cross-country runner generally should be pretty flexible, but they, they end up actually being pretty mobile. But generally, that athlete should be pretty flexible. So I know a basketball player is not going to squat as much, um, as, as low, right? But, you know, to, for their body height, what looks right? Can they at least get to parallel without their low back bending or without forward flexion? Those are the things we, we look for. Okay, okay. Um, fair enough. Um, so I want to ask you, so I think this kind of relates to, or at least I made the connection. When I, uh, for example, watched uh, Conor McGregor fight Mayweather, Yeah. and, well, a lot of people thought Mayweather just knocked him out, but I, I actually think just Conor McGregor got tired. He got really t It looks like he just got really tired. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the connection I made was that Floyd Mayweather focuses solely on boxing and McGregor is a mixed martial artist so he has to do all kinds of things boxing kickboxing grappling 
So he, he, he has to diffuse all his uh, attention rather than focus on one thing. Mm -hmm. So Mayweather's boxing efficiency is probably much higher than McGregor's boxing efficiency. Um, thus, like he is able to throw more punches and get less tired because of it. Whereas McGregor would get tired quicker because he focuses on all these other. Is that? Do you think that's the thing, in terms of what happened? Absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I I'm not sure about that sport in particular. I'm not that much of an expert. But if, you know, if people are saying that you know he got tired or he looked tired, then to me, two things come to mind: is that efficiency? Because in fitness, that's all it is. Is like are you efficient in that movement and no matter what your fitness if you're more efficient you can do that movement longer if you're less efficient you can do you can't do that movement as long yeah. and then the other thing is just look at their size and 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 how, what they have to move around for 12 rounds right yeah. McGregor is a lot bigger and he wasn't able to utilize that to a point to end the end the <laughs> end the fight earlier right so then the yeah. the the smaller guy with a little bit more endurance came through at the end yeah because at the beginning McGregor was holding his own and yeah. then, it's so like there's obviously other variables like your size and like your uh, cardiovascular fitness. Yeah. But like in terms of just an efficiency standpoint, you think it must have... I, I, think, I think it's efficiency. I think, uh, you know, um, I t you would hope at that point they will both be at their maximum uh, fitness. Right? Like <laughs> cardiovascular-wise? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cardiovascular-wise, there wouldn't be They're any, both elite anything athletes. left in the Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, efficiency and honestly, like, yeah, like s size. Um, but like take it to another sport, um, you know, how much energy do you think Usain Bolt expends in a, in a stride and how much energy do I expend in a stride? Right? <laughs> and the, it's what separates elite athletes is to be able to fire specifically the motor units that they need to fire and not have co-contraction of any sort of antagonist. Um, so what separates kind of like elite from novice is the novice takes more energy because they have random muscle activity in areas that they don't really necessarily need. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas an elite athlete has a distinct firing pattern that's very efficient. Okay. Um, and, and they can relax muscles a lot faster than a novice athlete can. So when, it, when, it, when, it, when you're talking about that, then maybe and that's really what you're talking about in terms of efficiency with every punch if you have a little bit more activity or if you're a little bit more unsure about where to throw um, versus someone like Mayweather who's going to be precise and not waste any more energy with every punch, then that adds up throughout 12. 12 adds rounds. up, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think this is something that is uh, acquired through skill, a uh, skill acquisition or is it something that's also mental? Because I, I'm huge on this. I think this is really important. Um, because I, as a wrestler, I wrestle people and they'll, I wrestle some people that are just super, super stiff. And I'm just like, first of all, you're not going to move efficiently. Second of all, you're going to get tired really quickly. Third of all, you're probably going to get injured because you're just so stiff. If something, you know, if your joint gets compromised, you're so stiff that it's going to tear, right? Yeah. Um, so I tell people to relax. Is it something that can be done mentally or is it? also through skill acquisition because you hear Bruce Lee talk about his have you you've heard of Bruce Lee's philosophy be formless move like water you put water into a cup becomes a cup you put water into a teapot becomes a teapot yeah. he says be like water like it takes the form of whatever is in front of it yeah um do you think that's a mental thing or do you think it's also just from practicing your skill Oh, that's a tough question. I don't think you can separate it. Like, how do you say it's mental or physical? How do you say? I think it's all one, and I think that's what Bruce Lee is saying: is is you can't have dominating physical <laughs> attributes without being dominating mentally too. Like, it's it's something that's definitely it's skill acquisition, it's imagery. Um, it's your ability to actually relax and recover. So, I mean, that's when you talk about pro sports, that's what they're really putting all their money towards is recovery because schedules are getting more intense. So mm -hmm. how do we help athletes recover, right? And, and I think, you know, there's a few ways that people can calm themselves, cal calm themselves down, and therefore calming the muscles down is whether it's meditation, and that's like very – dedicated and you have to be guided towards that there's things like progressive muscle relaxation so you can youtube progressive muscle relaxation and there's you know a bunch of videos from five minutes to an hour so just breathing minutes. or 
So that's a series of just, uh, I do it before bed sometimes if I can't fall asleep or I tell athletes to do it on the recovery days. Um, but it's a series of breathing exercises, but also um, tensing m m areas in your body and then relaxing them just so you can actually be able to relax into it. So, I mean, you can try it at home where you, you're just lying in, on your bed and you start tensing your toes, relax, breathe a little bit and work all the way up ankles, calves, knees, mm -hmm. hips, all the way up to your eyelids and then see how your body feels after. And I think that's one tool that people can use. Um, but yeah, I think you're on point in terms of like efficiency. I think it's part of it is skill acquisition. If you're better at the skill, then you don't have to spend as much energy doing that movement because you're more efficient. Mm. Uh, and you can see it. When novice athletes, it looks like they're trying their hardest. Yeah. And there's an elite athlete that, that's doing the movement better, but it looks like they're not even trying. <laughs> and that's yeah, where yeah, you yeah. can really observe it. Honestly, I, when I compete against someone and they're relaxed, it freaks me out. I'm like, why is this guy so relaxed? Well, this guy needs to tense up right now. Like, yeah. Uh, it actually, like, it makes me feel threatened when I, when I wrestle someone who's relaxed. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's crazy because people think it's the other way around. Um, but, yeah, speaking of your ability to relax and, and speaking of recovery, um, I want to ask you about some recovery methods. Um, what, like, and also mobility, because mobility is very important. If you want to be formless and you want to be able to move well, you have to be mobile, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much, what do you think is the best way to gain mobility? Because there's stretching, there's foam rolling. I actually got uh, into, a, into a heat, not heated, but a discussion with, a, of our, with our athletic therapist the other day. Um, shout out to Kevin, Rachel, and Claudia. I love you guys, but you know, we're, we like to get into discussion sometimes. Um, <laughs> uh, we got into discussion about foam rolling, right? And yeah. um, they, they live and die by it. I think, I think foam rolling is good. I think it's a good tool you can use. But does it really help you in the long term? Because from what I, what I understand is that when you foam roll, it, it causes your muscles to relax temporarily so that you can work out right away, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have an overactive muscle, it'll relax your muscle through like the autogenic inhibition uh, loop. If you can explain that to everyone listening, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, and so pretty much I go to the gym, I'll see people foam roll in the corner for like half an hour. And I'm just like, do you really need to do that in order to be prepared for your workout? Yeah. And I know you were talking about this in your class. So if you can explain er to everyone what, like what foam rolling should be used for rather than, cause I think there's a lot of, people that don't really understand it yeah well i mean first of all there's no really pile of research that supports foam rolling not saying that there's there's a lot of athletes that live <laughs> live by it and, and can't go without it and yeah and you try it and you feel better right so you, you, the question is why do you feel better so is it increased blood flow to the area so waking up the muscle is it because we can't stretch fascia? So, I mean, when you think about your muscles, it's surrounded by fascia. If you hang weights off of a fascia, it won't stretch. You have to manually release fascia, which is what foam rolling is, is, is you, before you start your session, you hope to release that fascia by foam rolling, by applying pressure, which is really the cheap version of a massage. Yeah. Um, and then there is trigger points. So trigger points is when you use lacrosse balls, softballs, and, and more f distinct areas where you apply pressure to. That's when the autogenic inhibition kicks in because you have a lot of pressure in one, motor, not motor unit, but one myofibril or a few myofibrils. Um, well, a lot of myofibrils, but one distinct muscle. Like and just a small yeah, little area. Yeah, just a small little area with a lacrosse ball or something. And... And then that, that goal, area then, tends to be like stiff? So that area is what you want to do is the trigger points are over areas where you feel like there's knots in your muscles. Okay. So what that does is it does a better job releasing that fascia. But the theory is, is it might apply enough pressure into the muscle for the Golgi tendon organ to relax that muscle for, I mean, the Golgi tendon organ is just a mechanism where if, if it senses too much force within the muscle to the point that you, that, you know, it thinks the muscle is going to 
uh, be damaged, then it causes inhibition to that muscle. Mm. Same way as how you fail a, a set. I mean, those uh, you over overpower muscle groups, and then the Golgi tendon organs kick in and inhibit it, and then you fail, and the bar co- crashes on the safety bars, right? <laughs> so it's the same way, but it's just a very small little um, time frame that you do it for, which is... You know, some people sit on this lacrosse ball for a minute. I mean, that's not really what you're supposed to do because you just want to get a little bit of onogenic inhibition to be able to um, lengthen that muscle. Um, so, yeah, those, those are the kind of the two different ways that you can do it. And, you know, is, whether it's blood flow to the area, whether it's releasing fascia, which is probably what it's really doing, um, or whether it's just placebo it makes people feel better. But um, the way I would suggest is it doesn't really make a difference what you do in a day. And that's with everything. Like anything. You do the best training program for a day, it really doesn't matter. (laughs) It's all about what are you doing for months, weeks, and years at a time, right? Consistency. Um, Consistency, right? Give your body the stimulus. We talked about at the beginning of this is we adapt. Well, you're not going to adapt a day you sit a whole day and you're you normally don't sit a lot you're not going to get tight hips mm. <laughs> but if you do that every day um or if you don't stretch or if you don't foam roll every day then you're probably going to see decreased mobility from it so the key with those stuff is to build it in your daily routine mm. five minutes max i would say foam roll or else you're just trying to make up for the fact that you didn't do it for a few days this week. Yeah. Which is fine, but that's is that you, we can't make up for that fact, right? You do five minutes a day times 365, that's a lot of hours that you have to sit there for one session in foam roll, <laughs> <laughs> right? And that will, that will have the biggest impact right there. So I think, you know, you foam roll first, then you get warm or you you know, get warm and foam roll. That's really depending on what you're doing to get warm. And then um, then you start your stretches or your correctives and all that. Okay. So, like, the key is consistency. Um, can you talk about, so, like, if if you want to get those effects, you say five minutes, how, how painful should it be? Like, should it be, like, painful? Because, you know, in order to get that autogenic inhibition, like, how painful should that be? Like... I mean, you don't want to get to a point where you're tensing your legs or you're tensing your arms or, or a body part that you're trying to release, mm-hmm. right? Um, at the end of the day, your nervous system is going to dominate anything that you do. So um, if you're foam rolling or if you're doing a trigger point to relax your traps and you just broke up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, it's not gonna work (laughs) because you're still gonna be stressed. Or you, so like what I'm trying to say is your nervous system dominates it. So if you try to go too hard, your nervous system is gonna take over and that area is gonna actually be more tense. But usually foam rolling shouldn't be comfortable. If it's comfortable, then it's probably an area that doesn't really need a lot of myofascial release. Stretching should not hurt. Like, that's the one thing that we do really wrong is, is we try to feel the stretch. Mm. You should barely be able to feel the stretch and just hold it and relax into it. That's, I mean, when we're talking about static stretching, that's, that's what we want. Mm. Um, and then there is the PNF stretching, which, which uses that autogenic inhibition to lengthen that muscle. So, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, would you say, like, 7 out of 10? Yeah, as, a, as a pain yeah that depends your 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 10 is a lot higher than uh, other people's 10 as a sport of wrestling i don't know right? i'm pretty soft i'm pretty soft <laughs> well relative to wrestling but i mean that's the thing like if you tell a wrestler seven out of ten they'll be in legitimate pain fair enough fair enough <laughs> right yeah. if you tell someone else that's not used to pain in the general population they'll be they'll, they'll be maybe okay with seven out of ten so yeah you really just want to observe like i i observe athletes all the time when they're rolling or trigger pointing and if like their shoulders or their face and they're grimacing while they're doing it then i'll probably walk over and have a talk with them but then then again if they're just on a ball and and on their cell phone on instagram or something i'll probably go and be like well what's this doing really (laughs) yeah so it's it's it is a fine line and there is to my knowledge there's no research based off of like how hard you should be going or um, how, how soft you should be going into that. But for stretching, there definitely is a, a negative effect of stretching too hard, and that actually tenses up the muscle, which is the same, con- which is the same mechanism as autogenic inhibition. You stretch too hard, the 
Kolji Ten, the, the muscle, muscle spindle will we'll just try to tighten that muscle up to try to protect it. Right? Because it feels like it's tearing? Because it feels like you're, you're overstretching mm. it and it's tearing that muscle, so it's a protective mechanism. Okay, okay. Um, so if you want to gain flexibility, you just do it with like a moderate amount of pain um, consistently. Yeah, like consistently, and it depends why you're not flexible. Is it is it stress? Is it mental? So we talked about the nervous system. Is it lack of sleep? Is it lack of hydration? Mm -hmm. um, is it bad nutrition? All of those, even if you stretch every day, formal every day, if if you know if your human <laughs> attributes lack in terms of a healthy lifestyle, then you're never yeah. gonna have any chance because you're gonna formal and do a great mobility session and be able to squat deeper than you've ever had, and then seven hours eight hours later do a squat and it's back to the same thing and that's what i mean by the nervous system dominating everything so uh that stuff is important foam rolling is important and and taking care of your body is important but if the mind's not healthy then it's never gonna work okay so like yeah you can't really cheat your nervous system you really just have to take care of yourself in, in like a holistic sense correct yeah because i mean you don't have any pain sensors in your brain so your body's gonna uh essentially make part of your body <laughs> stiff and feel that pain. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the theory out there anyway. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Okay, so um, you, you're talking about stretching. Um, so I see a lot of people static stretching before they work out. And uh, on your, your program, I've been doing a lot of ballistic stretching or like um, dynamic stretching before I work out. Mm -hmm. And um, can you explain that? why you should do dynamic stretches instead of static stretches before you work out and then static after? Yeah, so I mean, depends on what you're doing. Um, if you get warm and you static stretch and you're just you know doing a really slow, light workout, probably not gonna have an effect. But I mean, the things that you're doing is working on speed, agility, quickness, working on power. So for you to warm up and then do static stretching, what is static stretching designed to do? Is it designed to activate a muscle or is it designed to relax a muscle? Obviously relax. Yeah. Well, obviously relax a muscle. So you don't want to, the muscle to be relaxed, your joints to be relaxed, and then go ahead and do some fast movements, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's going to cause other issues or that's going to cause too much tension in your ligaments or your tendons or you're just not going to perform the movement as well as you th as you wanted yeah so you're going to waste the first set or two of your uh, first power phase or your agility or your speed whatever mm -hmm. um, or even your strength right so you're trying to recruit a lot of motor units um, what the, what dynamic stretching does is it briefly puts you through the end range of motion it keeps your heart rate up and it keeps the body temperature up so all of those things are crucial in terms of developing power and developing max strength. And that's why we dynamic stretch before and then we static stretch after because that's when we want to relax. That's when we want to signal our body to start the recovery process. Yeah. We don't want our body to start the recovery process when we're trying to exercise because what we're trying to do is get feel to the muscles to fire and not go ahead and repair the muscles and get protein in there to, and, and, and replace your st uh, your energy stores um, for the next session, right? You want your body to be able to get gly glycolysis going, get your aerobic system going, get your anaerobic system going, so then you have fuel to move fast. Yeah. Okay, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So um, pretty much when you're stretching, you're kind of like relaxing and inhibiting your muscle. You, you don't want to over relax it before you work out you kind of want it to be still a little bit stiff so it can fire quick there's like an optimal level of like yeah you want neural activation right you, you, you want neural activation you want to move your body to the end range of motion so then when it goes to the end range of motion fast you would decrease uh, risk of injury okay. you want neural activation to be able to recruit motor units right um, but for static stretching it does the opposite right it decreases neural drive to that muscle because it lengthens in a slow fashion, so neither the GTO or this muscle spindle can activate, um, and it decreases neural drive to that muscle. And when that neural drive decreases, that signals the recovery process. So if that muscle is damaged or you know the tissue is torn in any way, then that sig signals the recovery process. Okay, and if you uh, foam roll for too long, like the, before your workout, does this same mechanism occur? Because Again, you're just like signaling the recovery process because you've just been foam rolling for so long, or? 
Um, I don't know if the neural drive will be decreased. Maybe depends on how hard you're pushing. But um, if you're foam rolling for too long, then either you're wasting time, and it doesn't have any negative effects, but you're just wasting time. Mm-hmm. Or you could even say maybe you're starting to put, do damage to the muscle. Um, and the other major thing is like if you apply pressure to the area, then you're cutting off all of the supplies, and that includes oxygen. And you know, think about when you're doing a very intense conditioning session and your muscles start burning. Mm. That's because they don't have that oxygen. So you start getting an anaerobic effect. You start getting lactic acid um, released. And that's essentially what will happen. So if I put a softball on my quad and hold it there for two minutes, then I've cut off blood supply to that muscle for two minutes. And then it actually becomes tighter and angrier because it doesn't have any fuel or anything. Uh, so, like, how does the blood supply cut off just because of the mechanical stimulation? Well, you put, I mean, that, and that's the kind of the dangers of, um, like, the trigger points is if not done properly, you have to understand, like, by putting pressure through your muscles, you're putting pressure through that area. So if there's a nerve, if there's a blood vessel, that's all going to ha- feel that pressure. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. you're not just putting muscles. It's not like every one of our nerves and blood vessels is underneath the muscles protected. It's it's all there together. So, um, And that's usually when people trigger point their glutes and feel feel like a, a really, sh- you know, sharp area or tight area most of that is <laughs> is is a nerve near the piriformis wow don't form all too long guys <laughs> don't form all too long I, I don't know man like i just i go to the gym i'll just see that guy on the in the corner just foam rolling forever i'm like come on like uh i don't know i just just do it for like five minutes people do it for five minutes uh, yeah i mean there's nothing wrong with a session like if you're there and like you that's all you're doing today and and doing a session of foam rolling it's there's nothing wrong with that but i mean you have to have pretty good knowledge to uh do it properly because then you can actually do some damage but i actually like it for a little bit of a fitness slash body control like you get someone to foam roll their quads and actively like going all the way from the hip flexor all the way to the knee 10 times then going to the groin doing the same thing then the hamstring then the glute mm. that's to me sometimes i do that just for a warm-up components because they'll be warm their body is moving in different angles they're supporting their body weight with their arms the rotator cuffs are going mm. and that's kind of like a little 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 mini warm-up in itself if done properly right but okay um people just end, end up a lot on the foam roller for a while because at the end of the day it feels good Right, it's a massage without having to pay a masseuse, a masseuse or a massage therapist to work on you. It's a good idea, man. Whoever <laughs> came up with that, right? Um, okay, so switching topics, I want to ask you about the the speed strength spectrum because, um, from what I've noticed, is that, and I've I've actually done this for a long time, is people focus heavily on strength, and I feel they don't move along the spectrum to the speed side so they never actually end up developing power from what i understand is that it's a spectrum one end is strength the other end is speed and in the middle is power because power is strength time strength times speed right yeah um and the people i see so many people just power lifting they power lift a lot and then they never actually do speed work so it never translates into power so they just become these really strong people that are not really mobile, that can't really move and can't really produce explosive movements, but they think it's good just because they're so strong. Yeah. So like, can you um, explain the speed strength spectrum and how you can actually develop power and why why working speed is, is actually an important thing and how you can do it uh, in combination with uh, training strength in terms of like uh, dividing it into blocks? Yeah, so, I mean, it depends what your goal is, right? If your goal is to be as strong as possible, then lift heavy, lift slow, right? If your goal is to be fast, then as long as you have some base strength, then lift a little faster. So what you say is, like, people all the time want to lift heavy. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a byproduct of your world of of, of wrestling, Wrestling. right? Like, wrestling just tend generally athletes within wrestling want to just lift weights because – uh, you know, it's a combative sport, and you can't help but think that if I'm stronger, I'm going to be able to handle 
an external load like the other body a little bit easier for sure but i mean what separates bad wrestlers from elite ones is how fast they take control not really how they take control (laughs) like the strong guys and they end up doing well but then the really good guys are fast and explosive so that's why it it makes me mad And, and like another thing is i think it having power and being explosive translates to pretty much every sport almost like most sports yeah like basketball football volleyball whatever i think it translates to most sports yeah like i mean it's funny like when you talk about uh, you talked about volleyball i think volleyball is one of the sports that's actually the opposite where you have people marketing 14 year old girls uh, doing plyometric training when when really they can't hold a squat with their body weight for more than 20 seconds without collapsing. So mm. um, when, you, when you're trying to develop power, you have to ask a few questions. Is, is the, first of all, does the person move right in those global patterns? Um, if, if I can't do a loader, if I can't hip hinge properly, then what's the point of doing a plyometric program? I'm just loading up my knees too much and I'll have too much stress in lower body. Fair so enough. The person yeah. has to be able to move properly. Their mechanics has to be proper for it to actually work on anything. Um, after that, you have to have enough strength, right? Do you have enough strength in your lower body and you have enough strength in your torso to control the heaviest part of your lower body? When you think about most sports, power comes from the ground, right? You put your foot into the ground you start some sort of rotation or extension or flank flexion from the ground by putting force into the ground. So the force comes back up all the way through your legs and then it has to transfer all the way up to your head or to your shoulders or to your wrist or whatever, mm. right? And for that to happen, you have to think about torso function. So if I'm a, um, a volleyball athlete and I want to develop power to be able to jump as high as possible, well, I have to be able to put force into the ground, plantar flex my ankles, extend my knees, extend my hips, drive my arms up and get off the ground. And I have to move my whole body. And by the heaviest part of the body, I mean the head and the organs. So if I can't move that, if I can't transfer the force from the ground mm. to that area, then it's really useless how much force I can generate with my legs. Mm. So that when you're thinking about generating power, do you have torso power? Do you have torso strength first? Um, in terms of having enough strength in your lower body, they, they usually say you're ready for power work if you can squat at 1.5 to 2 times your body weight. Once you can do that, then you can probably do some plyometric program, then you can probably move to power. Um, and then with upper body stuff, they say that you have to at least uh, be able to bench your body weight to be able to do some explosive upper body work. So when we're generating power, we look at athletes, what's the sport? What do they need? Okay, are they strong enough? Do they move well enough? And then we start to develop power. And then when we develop power is, okay, what plane of motion do they need to develop power in, mm. right? Are they a rower that they just have to go forward and back, right? And that does, you know, it doesn't involve a lot of rotation or anti-rotation or stuff like that. But for example, wrestling, that's the sport where you need to move your whole body really quickly and efficiently. The body needs to act act as one. In, in right. many planes. In many planes of motion, right? So and that, then you start doing power single leg, double leg. You start doing power laterally, vertically, horizontally, <laughs> and then in all different angles that you can work on it, right? So um, the, the way we usually generate power is, you know, the first phase of the off season is um, – really about moving properly right and once the athletes achieve that then we start to build a base strength and then once we have a base strength that may involve putting more muscle on that athlete or that may involve getting their just their strength up Um, we usually go towards like a max strength and the max strength what it's about is recruiting motor units because that's what speed is that's what power is it's the same as max strength but you just have to do it fast so before you recruit all those motor units or your body learns to recruit all those motor units fast, it has to learn to recruit those motor units slow. Okay. So that's where your max strength phase fits in. And then, well, you can't recruit it fast if you don't practice that. <laughs> then you start transitioning into a power phase, for example. And that's where, you know, you start getting some loaded plyometrics, Olympic lifting fits in really well within that phase. But then you want to transfer it to speed because that's really what the sport involves. Um, And pure speed is just less force and now you have higher velocity, right? So it's, it's, 
uh, that's when you start doing your repeated plyometrics, body weight, your over speed work if you need some sp uh, if, uh, actual like sprinting speed, yeah. uh, which you probably wouldn't do with a wrestler, but that's when you would start doing your ply your med ball work, your plyometrics and all of that. And I think, you know, you, you said it best at the beginning is you start seeing these guys lift heavy and then they just, they're, they're strong, but they're slow. Well, that's that's one of the principles of strength and conditioning, right? The specific adaptation to impulse demand, the said principle. Okay, what are you demanding that athlete to do? That's what they'll be good at. So if you're always lifting heavy and slow, you'll be strong and you'll be slow. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> but if you know, going back to our volleyball athletes, if you're a 14 year old female volleyball player and you're on a plyometric program you have to ask yourself can you do a step up can you do a single leg squat if not then why are you doing single leg jumps yeah um can you, you do need some strength can you do a squat with your body weight if not why are you jumping with your body weight it's a lot right so um and then let alone torso right i mean there you, the amount of low back injuries we have coming into university because people really tend to do the major lifts Mm -hmm. um, and the concept there is if you do your major lifts, then your torso will be developed. Well, yeah, but it's not going to be developed to a point where you're doing 30 reps and maintaining good posture. No one really is doing that. Uh, if you were to truly want to develop your torso using your main lifts, you got to start doing sets of 50 and do it with perfect posture. And that's when you, you're, you're, uh, uh, spinal stabilizers will actually be able to get enough stimulus to develop so mm. um that's kind of my rant overall about that i'm not even sure if that answered your question really <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that exceeded expectations <laughs> um yeah so pretty much what you're saying is that obviously before you decide whether you want to train strength or speed or whatnot first you have to assess the athlete see what they need mm -hmm. so if they need strength then they gotta train strength. But if the if it's like like a fourteen year old volleyball player, right? Like they probably are not very strong. So why should they be training plyometrics, right? Yeah. They need um, hypertrophy. <laughs> they need yeah. They need hypertrophy then strength, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And then like if you're a slow person who's been training strength for so long, then you probably need speed work because that's that's pretty much the trap I fell into. Like as like a teenager, I was like I need to get stronger. I need to get stronger. So I would do a lot of hypertrophy and a lot of strength work. Yeah. And then I never really uh, focused on the speed aspect. And I found I was slow and I found that, um, you know, my footwork was bad. And then when I started working with you, that's when I realized I need to um, focus on those other aspects and become an athlete, not just someone who's a meathead, right? <laughs> so, Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's, if you would put it really simply, movement, uh, do you have enough muscle? Are you strong enough? Are you powerful? then work on speed yeah. and agility and, and all of that. And I think that's kind of the order that it should go um, with probably a few exceptions here and there. And that's an also, also another thing is like, it's not like if you're weak and you have no muscle, you can't work on jumping, but you have to work the ratio, right? I mean, you're not, that's not gonna be your primarily training effect. Mm -hmm. Your training effects should be putting on muscle, being able to move properly, all that. And on the other side, if you're working on speed, that's not all that you're doing. You're still doing some strength. You're still doing some isos. You're yeah. still providing your body that stimulus. And then there's also the external components. Like, you know, if a volleyball athlete is in high school and I'm training that athlete and that athlete has practiced five times a week, well, I'm not going to jump with that athlete because they're jumping five times a week for two hours. But in the off season, I might try to work on their jump technique while we get them stronger. Yeah. Um, so it's really about just kind of the global picture and then be able to work on everything, but know what your, um, I guess, what your focus is for that phase and for that year. And that's being able to plan out long term. And then when you talk about you as a teenager, uh, that goes back to our long term athlete development model. Like if you go on Canada's long-term athlete development, you'll see that there's windows of trainability for athletes. So um, by the time that you thought you were a meathead, that's actually probably the proper way to train as a 16, 17, 18, 19-year-old male athlete. Um, that's your strength window. Mm -hmm. So if 
if athletes that are male work out within that time frame, it's not like they'll be stronger than everyone else, but they're improving their ceiling for strength more than you could outside of it. So by the time you get to university, actually your ceiling for everything is realistically set. We just try to get you up to that ceiling. But um, for female athletes, that's actually like 14, 15, and that's when they should start doing the strength work. And when you look at all the, the windows of trainability, look at your past and, and, and other people's past that maybe are a little bit more stiff in that eight, seven, nine years old frame, there is the suppleness window. So are you doing sports that require range of motion and flexibility or are you working on that? Um, I really wish I did gymnastics as a kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the fact, and like I, if you compare someone that did and didn't, um, like for me, I, I think I missed out on a lot of the true speed component because I didn't really play a lot of sports at like 10 or 11 years old, which is like your speed window. Um, oh. So like a lot of people that are naturally fast, when you ask them what they did earlier on in life, they played soccer, they chased their dad to the mailbox every day or something like that. <laughs> and that's how you should develop true speed. So uh, it's it's a lot to do with how you grow up. And I actually learned a lot of that. And, and you know, who actually designed the first course is Steve when he was here, right? So um, he kind of introduced me to that world. And I'm like, that makes sense. Like when you think about it, like the people that are really strong is like, those guys that went to in grade 10 and went to the gym every day <laughs> and the people that are fast are the, are the people that you know did track and field did soccer were always active and everything like that so yeah yeah it's it's tough because like you can't really make those decisions when you're like 10 years old you're just like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do track and field so i can be a good wrestler when i'm older <laughs> no but the par i mean the parents should right I honestly mean, that information's out there and parents should get educated on that stuff for sure it's, uh, it's sickening to see p kids play hockey all year round or um you know the soccer clubs that are all year round now and it's yeah so be, being educated as a parent and putting your kids through the proper progression sets you on for success so my, my kid's gonna be a beast <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be that overbearing parent yeah. <laughs> kid's gonna drop out of sport at 18 years old <laughs> the coaches are gonna hate me they're gonna hate me no, no i'm kidding i'm kidding but um okay i have another question for you what do you think are the the most overlooked qualities in strength and conditioning like most underrated overlooked qualities that people do not pay attention enough attention to but really they should coaching like everything's about programming, what exercise you do, what technology you use, um, and people just don't watch movement, watch, like we've forgotten about the principle of individuality and we try to develop systems to fit everyone. There's no system that fits everyone. Everyone has different limb lengths, everyone has different sport history, everyone has different injury history. So I think coaching, like when I talk to the administration here and they've been very supportive um, from that standpoint is they ask like, what do you need? I'm like, I just need to have quality people here for a longer period so they can develop those relationships with the athletes so they can see a recruiting class go from year one to year four. Because my vision is by year three, you should be able to train yourself because we've given you all the education that you need in terms of learning who are you as an athlete, what body type you have, how you should train, what are the proper things that you should train. And and that's really the un most under underutilized portion of strength conditioning is coaching. And when you can look at it in Canadian setting is people hire one coach for 700 athletes. Well, you would never hire one coach to coach football, basketball, wrestling, and soccer all together. So why is there one strength coach for all of those teams? Now, the hours are a little bit less in, in season, but – it's also coaches that are in contact with the athletes 11 and a half months a year. So, yeah, I think coaching is kind of the most overlooked aspect of strength and conditioning. People think they can get a program and go work out and it's and they're going to be healthy. Well, the that's the problem. Strength and conditioning was designed to increase performance, not really health. So if you don't have a good person leading that and watching your movement, you're getting stronger. Maybe you're actually getting worse of your sport because you have those imbalances and all of that yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so i think the coaching and an educated person to see movement to be able to educate athletes to be able to adjust exercises to be able to to adjust rep ranges based on the nervous system availability they have that day 
is, is crucial. No, I, I, I really agree with that. I, I think that goes beyond just strength and conditioning. I think it applies to all sports, like mm -hmm. individuality. Um, like, I think certain coaches have like a certain philosophy and they just try to um, impose that on all athletes. Whereas you have to treat every athlete differently because like you said, they have different limb lengths, they have different qualities. Like some athletes can just be really powerful. Some athletes are more, uh, I don't know, they have better cardiovascular, they're not like as powerful, but they have better cardiovascular fitness or whatever it is. I think, yeah. I think that's really important. And um, something that I, I think that this leads to uh, Another question I've actually wanted to ask you is how do you uh, program because you're you're you work for McMaster and you work with so many teams how do you program so many programs for so many different sports um, like I don't understand how you can do that it's just uh, like how do you accommodate all the varying needs of all all the sports yeah, I mean, like, so when you think you look at our athletes is how many athletes are actually training for their sport versus how many athletes are just need to train. And that's, uh, that makes it a little bit simpler because, you know, in, the, in our setting is realistically, like, people just need to learn how to train and take care of their bodies properly. So, like, all of our sports have that in common. And then the, going back to kind of our administration being supportive is we have the ability to have four coaches to program differently for each team so it's just time right um, and in terms of programming it's not that much different but you have to recognize is the sport combative com combative or not is the sport loco locomotive or not um, like when you think about a sport of wrestling is you, you don't move like you would in other sports like in basketball and volleyball and football you're more upright while moving and wrestling you're more kind of seated back on your heels while moving realistically i just kind of look at the athlete and how they look in the main lifts and the whole team and how they look and then we program like that and then when it comes time to sports specificity then it's really the the rep schemes and the set schemes and the t and the rest times, the energy system development specific to that sport. But I wouldn't say we assign exercises based on one sport versus another. Um, we have things like, you know, I would give you more rowing and more posterior chain stuff because you're in that bend lower position. Same thing, I would give, you know, football bench press, but our volleyball athletes may not bench press as much. Our volleyball athletes, I don't know if they've ever really pushed a barbell overhead because one shoulder is moves so much different than the other shoulder, which we talked about posture changing for the sport, right? So yeah. that's those are the things that you have to recognize. Um, we're not going to do an intense plyometric program with swimmers that don't develop that stiffness because they're just going to get shin splints, <laughs> right? So those are the things that we think about, um, but we generally have the same sort of layout, uh, which makes it easier is, you know, in the off season, it's either a power day or a strength day or a hypertrophy day, or if it's a lower training age, they're doing a little bit of everything each day. Um, but yeah, that's tough. Like you could spend unlimited amount of time adjusting a program, tweaking a program, making a program, and it'll just never be perfect in your head, which is goes back to the coaching aspect. That's once you make a program, you have a coach there watching every day as an assessment. So then we go back to our programs, be like, well, this didn't work or this isn't working because a lot of athletes are coming up back to us with, you know, sore back or whatever. And that's kind of the last thing you, you want. So you start adjusting programs like that. But when you take a look at our sports here, you have your rugby and football, which is similar in terms of um, their season, but it's also similar in terms of their movements that they have to do. Football has more specificity position-wise, um, which we worked more towards later in the off-season. Um, 
where you know the receivers and the running backs and all that they might be doing more plyometrics and the old linemen are still doing more like you know a single effort like let's say a jump squat with a barbell or like a single clean or a jammer if we had one or something like that um versus a rugby where they would be very similar to a football training at the beginning but Obviously, they need a lot more aerobic component because the sport isn't not stop start. Um, Doesn't stop every like twenty seconds. <laughs> right, and then you add the body types are a little bit more similar. I mean, you could make a comparison between props and linemen, but you know the props are generally have to be a little bit more, um, you know, moving around, have some bop skills, have a little bit more mobility. Um, so they're more more towards like kind of like a defense and line, right? Um, so there is similarity that we can use to make our life easier. Yeah. Um, and then we can take a look. So those sports have the same seasons. Soccer has the same season, but it is a little bit of a different sport. Um, and then basketball and volleyball are relatively similar in, in their season and also in kind of the, the things that they need to do. Um, and then a sport like wrestling and cross country and swimming those are kind of the unique sports individual in nature but they're in a team their competition schedules are kind of all over the place so you need to be really uh, picky about where you what points of the year you push the athletes and it's not your general school year season um, so those are the things that make it tough but in terms of programming is scheduling first like take a look at the year okay at what points of the year do i have chunks of weeks that I can get a stimulus in and what stimulus should that be yeah. and we start from there right so December for volleyball and basketball they have no games it's between a very two diff two very long seasons first semester second semester they play the whole semester but they have that December off what do you want to maintain in strength and power that's uh that's really that's really our focus there is we do a lot of strength and power in that December Okay, so pretty much as long as you have like a certain set of principles you operate by, you can just like apply to, to varying sports. Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing is that planning, though. Um, I think you have to be able to understand at what points of the year are you accomplishing strength, power, strength, endurance, uh, conditioning, agility, speed, and when is that appropriate? And then once you have that set up properly then you create a program and then that program may be three different programs within a team if the team's very different or it might be just one program and then you coach and adjust individually during the sessions well front squat doesn't work for you because of your limb lengths then uh, let's try something else or a back squat doesn't work how's the traps how's the trap bar squat feel you try to find another exercise with the movement pattern that you're trying to work um, but generally, in terms of programming, we go um, your warm up, and then if you want to do some power, there's some power work, and then we generally balance out hip dominant, knee dominant, lower body lifts. We balance out push and pull, horizontal and vertical. Mm -hmm. um, and then every coach has their favorite exercises. Um, there's really no exercise that's going to make or break. It's really the principles that matter. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I have one final question for you, um, building on that. Um, so when you have a, an athlete who's trying to prepare for that one final, like obviously there's a bunch of competitions throughout the year, but they're trying to prepare for that one final event of the year, be it a national championship or a world championship, what are some general guidelines that you like to follow as you periodize them towards that competition? And uh, how do you pick the periodization method? So the athlete has trained with me the whole year or um, just kind of that I'm in charge of that, creating that one program before they compete in that big event. Or I've trained that athlete the whole year. If you're training them the whole year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I train them the whole year leading up to one big event, every single program that I've done before the last program should be leading to them to make them the, the best. And that last program is going to be probably their simplest program. Because at that point, it's now about the sport. It's now about stress. It's now about risk management. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing you want to do is go into the weight room and work on your sport, but then get injured, and now you can't play your sport. And then that's to me, that's number one. Like for you know, you're going to Iran in December. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So like for us right now, we can't risk you not going there. 
<laughs> so, that, so that's kind of like the risk versus reward. Do we want to increase a little bit more power? Yes. But do we want you to be healthy for that competition? Yes. So now you start to be really picky on what exercises you do. You pick exercises that you're comfortable with doing that you've done before. And now your reps and set schemes are very minimalistic, minimal dose response, right? What is the least amount that I can do with you that can have as the biggest impact? And I don't do a little bit more because it may have more impact. I just really make sure that it's the minimal dose response. Look, at that point, the work is done pretty much. Like you've been working out the whole year, right? So, Yeah, exactly. I mean, it depends on the athlete, right? But you work backwards. Is it like, where do you want to be? And then you think about your last program before the competition. What does that look like? Okay, the one before that. Uh, generally, when we periodize, we we work backwards. Um, so we go from the most important competition, whether that's um, whether that's a tournament or whether, whether that's like a national championship for a team, and then we work backwards from there. Um, and then you kind of have com- conversations with the coach or the athlete, being like, where can you? You know, a lot of the times it comes down to because the competition, it doesn't really give you a big break to train. It's like, okay, well, where can you afford to not perform as well? Because that's when we're going to push you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's tough for you guys because, like, you guys can provide us with tools, but it's just like if there's a competition there, it's so hard. But you can't let your ego get in the way. If there's a competition that's not that important, you can afford to train hard right before it almost, right? Right, right, Um, yeah. You have to to be uh, (laughs) long-term, approaching with a long-term vision, yeah, Yeah. to be able to know, yeah, I'm not going to perform my best this tournament. But that's okay because in four months, that's where I want to peak. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the toughest thing in sport really to do is, is, is take a step back to take two steps forward. Put that ego aside. Yeah. For sure. All right, Ben. Well, I think um, we are going to conclude because I think we're getting close to the hour mark. Yep. But thank you so much for being on. I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure the viewers have learned a lot as well. Um, it's always a pleasure working with you. And guys, tune in for Battling Basic Episode 5 next week. I'm not going to reveal who I have on, but you will see next week. Partly it's because I'm not sure yet. (laughs) But uh, yeah, anyways, again, thanks, Ben. Um, If you guys want Ben's social media or whatnot, I'll make sure to put it in the description. Um, And yeah, thank you. All right, thanks for having me on.